Welcome to my show, Robert Cheek. I almost had the urge to call you Dr. Robert Cheek for no reason at all. Muscle Dr. Robert Cheek. <laughs> thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I appreciate you having me. Great to talk to you today. Yeah, it's wonderful to uh, have some interviews here and there. It's been a while since I've had an interview. So um, I'm switching studios right now, so I'm just in my bedroom. So y'all can relax about that. I know people are gonna be commenting on every single object in my room, that's okay. Anyway, Robert Cheek is somebody who's been an inspiration to me. I saw him when I lived in Chicago. He talked about gaining muscle and I was 15 pounds lighter. Not that I'm like a bodybuilder or even buff or big in any way right now, but I was even 15 pounds lighter then. A few weeks after I heard him talk, I immediately got things together and gained pretty much all that weight that I've gained. It's, I'd like to say it's all muscle, but it's not. And then the crazy part about Robert Cheek, sorry to like not even let you talk. Um, you've now officially put a hundred pounds in your frame as a vegan. So you want to talk about uh, like how long you've been vegan and stuff? Yeah, thanks, Mike, and thanks for coming to that uh, talk in Chicago. I've I've so enjoyed uh, touring over the last fifteen years, and yeah, I just had my twenty fifth vegan anniversary, so that was very exciting. December eighth. So for me, it all started December eighth, nineteen ninety five, and I know it. I have it documented. I was using a little camcorder back then. Um, that I got when I was 14 years old, and it was an animal rights week that was taking place at my high school. I was a sophomore. I weighed 120 pounds. I was a five-sport wow. athlete, but I was like the smallest on every team. And, you know, I wanted to get bigger and stronger. I, I, I had aspirations as a young kid of, of being like He-Man or Captain Planet or being a pro wrestler. And uh, here my sister introduced me to this animal rights week where we listened to speakers. We watched videos of factory farming and animal testing and read literature and had conversations. This is pre-internet, this is uh, 95, at least you know, we didn't have the internet for another year or two. And uh, it was something that really resonated with me because I grew up on a farm, I was living on a farm, spent my whole life on a farm, and had cows and goats and chickens and turkeys and geese and ducks and rabbits and uh, guinea pigs and all kinds of animals, horses, ponies. And, and at that moment, I decided I, I just didn't want to contribute to animal suffering anymore. Once it had been really shown to me on a larger scale than my family farm and the dairy next door and the dairy, you know, a mile down the road and, and that kind of thing. And so I set out on this journey to uh, become vegan. I, I really didn't know what it was. I didn't know how long I would stick with it. Honestly, Mike, I, I gave it a week mm -hmm. uh, because that was the, it was the animal rights week for my high school. And that week has now uh, turned into more than a thousand weeks, if I'm doing the math correctly, and, nice. and a quarter century. 25 year long week. Yeah. So you, you grew up around animals. So yeah. you were a particular, it's funny because a lot of people that grew up around animals, especially in farming are desensitized to animal suffering. And so somehow you were able to see that and be like, no, I actually care. And I'm going to, uh, it was probably your sister's influence probably helped too. Yeah. You know what? I always cared though. That's the thing. I just, I just always cared. I mean, you, as a farm kid, you're often involved in 4-H, you raise animals, you're very close with them. That means training with them. And no matter what it is, even a, a chicken, you're, you're practicing spreading their wings. You can identify the feathers and all these different things that you do in 4-H. And then ultimately we would uh, sell the animals at the auction. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, it's a, it's, a, it's a way to make money. You're very excited. You don't think about where they're going, um, what their life is going to be after they leave you. And, and sometimes you're, you're, you're sad. You, you miss them, especially some of the larger animals like, um, like uh, uh, dairy cows. You know, I, I hesitate to call them dairy cows, but that's mm -hmm. in 4-H. That's how you you kind of classify them as, as beef cows or dairy cows, even though they may be Holstein or Jersey or whatever um, they're actually. So you actually people. did for the 4-H program? I was, I was full Whoa. into it. I mean, uh, my parents were really big into 4-H. All my siblings and I've got three other siblings. We we're all in 4-H. My, my brother to this day is like the, the beef superintendent at the county fair. Um, it was Super a full beef on brother. Program. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I was involved in all of that. But I, I did, I became vegan for ethical reasons. I was, uh, I was really into it, animal rights. And I got into, as a teenager, you know, writing papers for school about animal rights and, and uh, protesting things like circus that came to town and that kind of stuff. And then I just pursued my athletic endeavors, you know, as a, as a mm -hmm. teenage kid and got better and better and played varsity sports and went on to run cross country in college. But at this time, I was still only 150 pounds. Yeah. But it was, after, it was right that, at that time, age 19, that my... Uh, childhood friend Jordan introduced me to the sport of bodybuilding and I started lifting weights and just got bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger and and here I am you know uh, 
just about 220 pounds. Um, yeah. Pounds so that's later. funny that you were running when you were, I was 150 pounds running in high school running track too. But one thing that I remember, which, uh, you know, sort of a little bit more detail into what you were just talking about was how you were going to the gym and you worked out every single day for a year and you gained, how much was it? One pound. One pound. Yeah. So, so that was what, what kind of resonated with me. Cause I had done that, not put as even as much effort into it. Like I'd work out your three, maybe two or three times a week for a year or even a couple of years and gaining absolutely nothing, eating meat. And then also being vegan. Uh, it didn't matter. Like I just wouldn't, wouldn't gain anything. It's not like, I'm a hard gainer, blee, blee, blee. And anyway, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what switched? So otherwise, because you're still not 150 pounds. So obviously something changed. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, it's, I, I, I obviously write about those stories in my books and they make it into some interviews and conversations and other ones they don't depending on the, you know, the time we have and the depth we go into it. But yeah, I've often told that story in my presentations and, and lectures that, that when I got into lifting weights, I mean, I had all the enthusiasm in the world. Like I, I wanted to be like the next big thing, you know, I mean, I was very motivated as a kid, which enabled me to succeed in athletics, even as a kind of a small guy and not very big or strong. I just, the work ethic was just always there. And so what happened, Mike, I was working like crazy. I was still running. I was cycling. I was doing like, you know, a, a thousand crunches a day and hundreds of pushups a day. I documented everything. Plus I was lifting weights six days a week. And so what happened was, as I'm sure you can figure it out, do the math. I was just expending so many calories. I was just burning so many calories. I was still an endurance athlete, running, cycling, body weight exercises, and then weights where I even would run to and from the gym mm. uh, where I was living at the time. And I, I never put myself in a position to build mass. I wasn't eating a surplus, a caloric surplus. In fact, I was in a deficit, so I was just maintaining. You know, I, Basically, I would, my weight would just go up and down by the day depending on – what meal I had just consumed, but it just stayed the same for a whole year. And that was despite, I mean, incredible enthusiasm, just so into it. Reading muscle magazines. I was even taking like, you know, some, some sports supplements, you know, um, protein powders or, you know, whatever I was around that was vegan that I thought might help me back then. And it still, it didn't make a difference. Then one, then something clicked, a um, very popular book called the body for life program. Um, obviously their, their agenda was to sell whey products and their own, um, myoplex I think it was, you know, uh, EAS, yeah, EAS, myoplex, their products. But within this book by Bill Phillips, he really stressed the idea of eating six meals a day, which allowed for some sort of consistent calorie intake, three of the meals being bigger, three being smaller, a consistent training, like weight training. And it was really a scheduled program. It was like 45 minute workout. So no more hours of training per day. It was just really squeezed down into 46 minute workout, 52 minute workout. And then, I mean, I, I did the program. I put on 12, uh, uh, 19 pounds in 12 weeks, 28 pounds in 10 months, another 10 pounds after that and became a competitive bodybuilder by the next year. Uh, and, and, and that was from absolute utter failure where, I mean, really the, the dilemma, the conversation was, Robert, just stick to what you're good at. You know, I mean, I could run a mile in under five minutes. You know, I was a, I was a pretty fast runner. Like, I could have stuck with that and, and run cross country and, and all that. And, but I just wanted to get bigger and stronger. You know, it's just something I always wanted to do uh, for my own reasons. And luckily, a, a plant-based diet did not inhibit that at all. Um, I'm not going to say it, it, it super enabled it. It just, it was the combination of, of hard work, consistency, and a plan that actually yields results that ultimately helped me embark on a vegan bodybuilding career. Yep, yep, yep. The heart wants what the heart wants. So little runners want to be little bodybuilders, and then uh, or big bodybuilders. And uh, obviously, the moral of the story here is you just can't build muscle on enthusiasm alone. You need to uh, have some extra fuel. And I've, I, I want to do some more research on this because I think that there's something that definitely shifts in the body as well. If you've had a uh, a caloric surplus for a while, you know, whether it's like growth hormones or or something like that. What I, well, how I interpreted what you were talking about was. I just hopped on to chronometer and just made sure that I ate 3000 calories a day. And that put even, it sounds like it was almost faster than you. Cause I put, I think I put on 10 pounds in like three weeks. So I don't know how those, those match up, but basically uh, more than you can possibly build in terms of muscle. I probably, I built some muscle, built some strength, but uh, it was, it was a little bit of chub too. But over time I, I was able to just have that lighter calorie surplus. 
and then continue to gain a little bit, a, a modest amount. All right, so I think you should mention what Vegan Strong actually is because people don't realize, might not realize that you're doing some good activism. In fact, I've seen, I've heard at expos, they just stand there as people walk by, flex and say, go vegan or die. Is that what it is? No, uh, not at all, actually. We don't do anything, <laughs> oh, wrong one. We, we, Sorry. we don't do anything like that. Um, but what we do is, uh, <laughs> so we, we are a nonprofit organization of plant-based athletes who travel around the country to show that plants have all the protein you need. And so uh, we collaborate with dozens and dozens of brands to distribute their products and coupons and literature. We, we created this, uh, yeah, 32-page full-color booklet full of recipes and uh, meal plans and, and workouts and photos and all these tools to encourage people uh, to go plant-based. And so at our events, it's a 95% uh, non-vegan audience, uh, super mainstream athletes. And so um, I joke, Mike, that even at 220 pounds, I'm one of the smallest people on the team. You know, it's a team of champion, bodybuilders, uh, powerlifters, figure, bikini athletes, men and women uh, of mostly the bodybuilding sport background. And uh, we, we really do an excellent job of interacting with thousands and thousands and thousands of people at every event we go to. And so now that we're not doing that, uh, we still want to promote Vegan Strong and keep the organization alive, keep the dream alive. Uh, we write content for veganstrong.com. We created the Vegan Strong box as a way to you know, bring in some revenue because we used to sell things like the box, but it was in a tote bag instead. Uh, and, and, you got sh and shirts, like you're not, you don't have yeah. your table of shirts. So you guys definitely check it out. Go to veganstrong.com. Yeah, I got all the swag. And so, as I've mentioned in a previous video, you've started doing the Vegan Strong Box. You've been nice enough to send me an even newer one. Boom. We got a bunch of good stuff in here. I don't even know if I, <laughs> it's just pouring out. Um, we're just going to taste test everything in this together, including the almond flour that's on top. I'm going to taste test this right now. <laughs> Boom. Aloe juice. We've got some other products. We've got some of this uh, Nitro Cold Brew. Uh, you've got to, ooh, this, I, I feel like I, a real bodybuilder if I, if I roll up to the gym with one of these things. And then you got to, you got to be like working out and shaking it unnecessarily often because that's what I always see people in the gym doing. Real, real bodybuilders, not me. I, I, I can't do that. Uh, now I can. Or gain. Speaking of, uh, oh, and you got some Vega protein. So speaking of proteins, I wanted to ask you if you view any uh, particular plant-based sources of protein um, powdered or not as better or that have helped you or that are your favorites? I'm sure people are wondering. Yeah, uh, man, I don't know how to do that in a condensed fashion. But first, I want to say thank you for the shout out for the Vegan Strong Box. Uh, for those that don't know, we have spent years touring, exhibiting at the largest fitness expos in, in the world, the Arnold, you know, the Arnold Classic, the, the Olympia, the LA Fit Expo. And we exhibit with uh, Vegan Strong and, and try to uh, show people uh, effectively that plants have all the protein you need. And we've been received very, very well. Obviously not touring now. And so the uh, Vegan Strong box uh, was born and it's been doing really, really well so far. Yeah. Um, I think it, it, it's really difficult actually for me to address that because I've constantly been at a crossroads for like the last nine years. I think you know this personally about me is that I actually don't use uh, protein powders or any sports nutrition products. I have not since 2012, since I took Dr. T. Colin Campbell's plant-based nutrition course through Cornell University with the Center for Nutrition Studies, and that challenged my view on, uh, on, on protein supplementation, but also protein emphasis. I know that's ironic because our, our current Vegan Strong Box is loaded with protein, including yeah. that full-size bag of almond yeah. protein you saw. But I'm, I'm really a big fan of showing people that there is a, a plant-based alternative that is just as good, if not better, than the whey and casein proteins that are out there. And I'm also, you have to remember, I'm, I'm in the bodybuilding world in addition to being in the vegan plant-based world. And so I'm taking people who consume literally whey protein, casein protein, mm -hmm. egg protein, beef protein all day long. Like that is, that is how people eat in the sport of bodybuilding. And so we're trying to show, we're not trying to get people to go, you know, whole food plant-based overnight. It's yeah. just not an effective form of activism and advocacy. And so that's where, that's why my involvement with all these different uh, brands comes from to make a real difference in that way. Mm -hmm. As far as actual protein quality, I mean, it might surprise some people. Um, like I told you, I weigh about 220 pounds. I ate a little over 3,000 calories a day presently, last time I checked with chronometer and documented it for weeks. And my protein intake is, is 100 grams or less. I mean, it's, 
Um, the real percentages, this is just real data, is 70% of my diet is carbohydrate, 10% uh, protein, 20% fat. And so my, I don't even have like this, this emphasis or desire for particular proteins. Mm -hmm. And so I can't tell you necessarily if tofu or tempeh is, is better or has yielded better results for me or others. Um, there are plenty of, of, of vegan fitness coaches that specialize in that kind of stuff. Um, I've more... I've just focused more on eating uh, to the best of my ability, quality nutrition, and combine that with hard work and, and work ethic and desire and, and, and goal setting and what I'm trying to achieve. And that's paved my way for me. So uh, you probably know more than I do, uh, which yeah. proteins, you know, have a higher, you know, uh, protein digestibility, corrected amino acid score or higher bioavailability than others. Like I, I just, I just don't stress about it. Like I, Maybe I should because I write on this subject, but I really try to tell people, you know, protein's important, but it's not the biggest thing in the whole world. Like there's other aspects. Uh, I mean, think about it just for a minute, Mike, just think about it. How many people obsess about protein so much, but they're at the gym, like playing on their phone instead of even having some sort of- <laughs> Oh, I say that all the time. On their, on their workout. Or they're, they're so focused on protein, but they avoid leafy green vegetables and fruits, the, the highest antioxidant, mm. highest nutrient dense, the best return on investment calories we can consume. They're, oh, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Which uh, might help or, them recover and then gain more muscle faster. Or, or they're doing like three, four uh, energy drinks a day and they can't sleep properly, which is where muscle growth happens and where recovery happens, yet they're obsessed with protein, but they're not allowing themselves that rest recovery growth period. They're not focused on mind muscle connection. They're not maybe mentally into it with a particular goal setting and having something to work toward and having a program or a plan, but, but their mind is just focused on protein. And so that's, I've seen that take over so many people's total approach and, and it just doesn't always get the job done. Absolutely. So for anybody who's just trying to get bigger and a normal, you know, a normal person and, and being healthy, I, I, it's pretty obvious you don't need protein i i my guess is that if you're doing like steroids and all of those things and you're trying to get as big you know younger try to get as big as possible to do like ifbb pro you know logically it seems like you might gain a little bit more mass with with protein powder but i don't have a study so it's all just throwing throwing ideas out there i also know there are people who it's just their digestion is kind of crappy they, they need to work on it and so they it, it, although protein powder is horrible for your digestion but for some reason, they think that they can't get, they can't like eat enough protein from whole foods. Anyway, we could talk about this for a while and that's frustrating, but the box, <laughs> by the way, I believe we have a code, discount code, Mike the Vegan, uh, for $5 off for you. And yeah. uh, it helps me out too. So you can check that out. But I, I want to ask you a little bit about your actual uh, bodybuilding uh, like competitive stuff. So you're talking about you want to be a competitive bodybuilder. And so you've been doing natural bodybuilding competitions or you were doing that for a while. So yeah, out? I also want to address something you just said, Mike, too, because there's also something else that happens within the within the body, and I, I think it's it's fairly obvious for some, and maybe not so obvious for others. And that is the fact that when you put on more mass, like you just have more mass to work with, you can push more mass, mm -hmm. you can stimulate more muscle growth. You can, I mean, you know, I got up to you know, squatting hundreds of pounds, leg pressing a thousand pounds, using hundred pound dumbbells, and eventually 120 pound dumbbells in each hand for chest press and things like that, and and when you and then that builds more mass and when you have more mass you can push more weight mm -hmm. stimulate more growth and it, it just has this like trickle effect that once you get balls in in motion it, it makes everything a lot easier For and sure. so that so that you know is something that that obviously plays a factor just like the lighter you are typically the better you're going to be at perhaps marathon running or long or very very long distance running uh, something in the half marathon marathon ultra marathon range that just that just enables you to perform better, um, your, your strength, strength to weight ratio. So for me, that was part of it too. You know, once I started making sure. progress, I could make even more progress because so I'm, if you haven't made any progress yet, maybe you should just strap tiny weights all of like strap like 30 pounds worth of little weights all over your body. And then you'll be able to gain more. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of funny things you can do. I mean, I, I did almost like that. You know, those, did you ever see in those magazines growing up, um, uh, where you had these special shoes where you only walk on your toes. It was to help you like dunk a basketball. Mm. <laughs> I think I remember. I remember yeah. So it was, it was shoes. You only walk on your toes to strengthen your calves. And so I lived on a farm, not having a lot of money. I used like a, a block, a two by a four. Wedge. Block. You, you used like a shim. <laughs> I, used, I used like a two by four block and like duct tape 
Yeah. And then I would practice and practice and practice. And eventually, I mean, even as a high school kid, I, I could dunk a basketball only at like five foot nine at the time. And I also, you know, when I got into bodybuilding, calves were one of my uh, strongest muscle groups on the bodybuilding stage. And partly I think that came from, yeah, using some of those techniques. Like you, like you said, you could wear a weight vest or you could yep. wear a heavy, heavy backpack. There was things you could do. Um, I worked a security job for a while at Hewlett Packard which mostly were three-story buildings. And I would use that as an opportunity to get ready for bodybuilding competitions. I would just climb stairs all day long and use it as like, you know, working hard, not just like going up the stairs, but like I made that a workout. So you can use all kinds of things at your disposal. And you stuck to natural bodybuilding. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've I've been, not only that, I've been lifetime drug and alcohol free. So no beer, no wine, no. Vegan straight edge right there. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm you know, 40, 41 years old in a few weeks. And that was, that's another story, too. That was just my own uh, personal decision to, as a teenager, to be drug-free and have continued to honor that uh, my whole life. So um, I've never even actually seen what a, a steroid looks like. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I obviously know people like famous bodybuilders who have used them, but I, I don't know what they look like. never seen them in, in person. Um, I hear just a like, giant syringe, giant syringe with red fluid in it. And I, and I hear people put them in their, in their, in their butt cheek, uh, which yeah. I, mean, I guess it's a, it's a thick tissue. So maybe that's, I have, than- I've been in the house of a bodybuilder and I opened the fridge and there was like a syringe of HGH. And I was just like, Holy crap, this is serious. <laughs> like, yeah, I've, hormone. I've, I've never even seen it. Even in the bodybuilding yeah. culture I've been in for 20 wow. years with pro bodybuilders, famous bodybuilders hanging around them, um, at least at the gym, never at their house or anything. I, I just haven't seen it. So, uh, so yeah, Mike, I, I mean, I, uh, I was talking about 1999, um, 2000 when I first got into lifting and I was actually ready for a competition by 2001. Mm-hmm. Um, fortunately got mono that year. Didn't know oh, it. No. <laughs> didn't know it. I you're, thought not, it was, you're not the first vegan who said they got mono and didn't, and didn't really know it for a long time. Yeah. Well, I didn't know it. I thought it was, I thought it was a byproduct of preparing for bodybuilding competition. Mm-hmm. I just heard bodybuilding was hardcore. You're on like this extreme diet. You're going to feel uh, your carb depleted. You're going to get headaches, okay. get hydrated. And I ended so up you did feel like crap. Oh yeah, I mean, I, and I was, I still trained with it every day, feeling like someone's hitting me in the head with a hammer. But I thought, oh, this is part of the sport. And I ended up in the hospital. And I said, can I still compete? And they said, you're not. The, the competition was two weeks away, and I was even, I even had a flight back to Oregon, uh, you know, from Arizona to compete in my home near my hometown. My family had bought tickets, and it was a big deal for me, and I, I couldn't do it. And and uh, and I was quite, I was quite, you know quite sick during that time um, because I'd mono and still push it seven days a week in the yeah, gym. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's rough. You probably so, would have been fine. So I had to wait uh, two years later, 2003, did my first competition. And by 2005, I won my first competition uh, in natural bodybuilding. And then I continued to compete for um, almost a decade. Around 2010, decided that, uh, you know, I'd rather do something different. So from kind of 2000 to 2010, I competed. I I filmed a documentary on the lifestyle. I I did a bunch of things and decided I wanted to go back to my other uh, childhood passion uh, love that I've had since eight years old. And that's writing. And so I, I wrote books and now I'm uh, my, my fifth book comes out uh, very soon. So heck yeah. What's it called? The plant-based athlete, the plant-based athlete, keep your eyes and ears open for that as well. And so it just a quick, I'm I'm sure there's people who are trying to gain muscle and, and cut and all that stuff. You just have a bunch of random questions, but one that I could, imagine people are just wondering or at least i wonder sometimes is if you are cutting you have this like gain cut cycle when you're pre- preparing for a competition you're you're doing a kind of like a zigzaggy gain cut or you're just doing like a big gain and then a big cut like how does it work for you yeah it, it works differently for different people and depend on the era too really you know i mean i was mm-hmm. i was in the era of the early 2000s or late 90s early 2000s which was um you know extreme bulking you know just t- raise your body fat like crazy put on as much mass as possible and then drop as many pounds as possible for competition. Uh, I mean, I once dropped nine pounds overnight, all water weight, of course. Um, that was, that was tough. Uh, <laughs> I, it, uh, I mean, I, I, I was so thirsty. Um, but I, because I, I, I was competing in Bend, Oregon at uh, the Bill Pearl classic. He's, he's an iconic bodybuilder who was vegetarian by the way during the 70s and and most of his life if not his whole life and he used to beat Arnold Schwarzenegger on stage I mean he was Mr. Uh, America Mr. Universe and vegetarian guy so I was thrilled to meet him and compete in his show but I I weighed in the night before overweight and I had to the the hotel or motel I was staying in they had a hot tub 
<laughs> and I got in the hot tub. It was like doing these like chest exercises oh, in the gosh. hot tub. And then I didn't eat anything or drink anything. Went to bed, woke up the next day. Um, I, I brushed my teeth, but I couldn't even drink water because that's weight. And my mouth got so dry. Like if you've ever brushed your teeth and then go directly to like exercise and I had like four layers of clothes on. I've experienced some cotton mouth before, yeah. Not yeah, good. yeah. And, and I literally four layers of like pants and shirts and sweatshirts. And then I weighed in. I only had to drop three pounds. I ended up dropping nine. Um, but, <laughs> Oops. But, I, but then I ate like crazy. I was just drinking like, you know, Powerade or anything that I could. And, and all that sugar just filled up my veins. And I was oh, one nice. of the best competitions I did. And it was nice. a non drug tested one. So I was competing against athletes that may or may not be natural. And I got third place um, out of like seven. Nice. Weeks. Maybe you good. accidentally figured out a good strategy. Like you overcut the night before and then you just get pumped super hard. Like your, your blood pressure probably goes to like 200 and your, your veins are just like tubes <laughs> coming yeah. out of your body. And, and actually I wrote about it, you know, yeah. self this book, I wrote about that experience um, because I did kind of accidentally stumble upon that. And, and every competition after that, I did the same kind of thing, like yeah. Sour Patch Kids or whatever. It became this, this, this sugar rush, which then fills your, your veins out a little bit. Yeah. And, and, and the carbohydrates make your muscles a bit more full. And yeah, You got to get some glycogen in there. Come on. You can't just be yeah. dying. Um, so well, thank you so much. Yeah. And, and Mike, and, and lastly, if anyone does want to check out any of my current work, I do have those four self-published books out there. Shred It and Plant-Based Muscle were the most recent ones. They're on Amazon. They're on veganbodybuilding.com. And, uh, and you can always check those out. And the new one, plant-based, the plant-based athlete is going to be out in a matter of months. So that's in a matter of months. Okay. So we'll look, look at that. So you have to, if you've just started your 2021 new year's resolutions, and this is helping you work out, learning about this, getting buff, you have to keep doing your resolution and at least until that book comes out Buy the book and then keep going even further. And then, uh, hopefully you can make that new year's resolution, your lifestyle. That's how I like to look at it. Anyway, <laughs> the point is, thank you so much. It's awesome to hear your story and share your story. 25 years, 100 pounds, which um, if, if it's anything like the weight I've gained, it's not 100% muscle. But, uh, you know, I'm, I may be like 80% muscle. Who knows? <laughs> what do you, how much do you it's think? Always a combination. You know, I, 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 you, can, you, know, I, I you, you get the right angles, you flex, yeah. um, but there's always the, you know, the body fat there too. And that's oh, just for part sure. of that. That's and just, it's good. You're just keeping it healthy. You're not doing any, you're not doing any, uh, last minute, uh, hot tub sessions, losing nine pounds right now. So <laughs> not anymore. I walked away from that about a decade ago. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much. Take it easy. Stay safe out there. And I hope you can get torn again sometime soon. Thanks, right. Mike. Appreciate thanks. it. Peace.